Hi, and welcome to the End Times Guide Podcast. My name is Lee, and it is an honor to have you joining me on what is probably the least entertaining podcast you will ever hear. My recording studio is crossing a bridge right now in Sandpoint, Idaho, at 90 kilometers, roughly 55 miles an hour. And it is what it is. You know, I'm not going to be able to produce a very entertaining podcast uh, because of my inability to write out a script, to plan it, uh, to sit down and record it professionally. And I have Asperger's, a mild form of autism, which makes communication difficult for me as well. So coming from a carnal perspective, there's I just can't give you a good reason to listen to this podcast. Furthermore, I have absolutely no interest whatsoever in tickling ears and saying things that people want to hear. The real reason I do this podcast, first and foremost, is to glorify God. I was reading in Romans chapter 1 last night and really mesmerized by how much Paul puts into one passage of Scripture. Point after point, every single line has to be unpackaged and fully realized. It's just amazing the depth of knowledge that goes by so quickly as you're reading. Um, But the point is, God made the heavens and the earth. He made the trees, the water, the air, the food. Every single day, we are the recipients of a bounty of gifts. Many, many, many new gifts every single day. And God's expectation is that we return thanksgiving and honor to Him. Why do you give a gift to a child? To see their delight, to see their happiness. What about a child that you give gifts to and they're not thankful in the least? It's called a spoiled brat. And a spoiled brat has to be disciplined. And this is the point we're in today. We neither honor God nor give Him thanks. And there is a result. God's discipline for the spoiled brat is actually terrible. It's terrible. He gives them over. I read that over and over again. He gives them over. He gives them over. He gives them over. And think about what that means. What transaction those simple words are representing. To give away means to begin in a position of possessing or holding. So God is holding us as we're honoring him and giving him thanks. We're in a position of being held by God. And that's a great position. I really like that position personally, to be held by God. But as their attitude towards God darkens and sours, they don't respect God. They don't honor God. They don't thank God. So their position changes. God is no longer holding them. Just a tight little pass there. Uh, God is no longer holding them. He's in the process of opening his hand and setting them down giving them over. Now, the place they go to when they leave God's hand is a terrible place. It's not a great place. Because as we read in Romans 1, things start to happen. The person starts to change when they leave God's hand. Their foolish heart is darkened. Now, I'm not sure if your heart was foolish in the palm of God's hand. It must have been. Because only foolishness could lead us to rejecting God and turning from God, who is holding us lovingly in the palm of his hand and supplying us with everything we need. It would take a supreme act of foolishness to reject that. So our foolish heart is darkened. And professing to be wise, they became fools. And that's just terrible. So... We, we are fools in the palm of God's hand, and he says, okay, have it your way, and sets us down. 
And outside of God's hand, we begin to change. We metamorphose into something hideous. A hideous creature, let me describe this creature for you, outside of the nurturing palm of God's hand, our foolish heart becomes dark. There is a darkness, a cancer that spreads in our heart, and we begin to change. We begin to perceive ourselves as wise. I want you to look at this creature and understand what's going on here. Their heart is dark. They're, they're in the throes of supreme foolishness, and their heart is turning dark. They've left the light of God's grace, and a darkness is spreading through their hearts. They do not perceive the truth anymore. They do not understand or acknowledge what is right and wrong anymore. They, But you know what's worse? They think of themselves as being very wise. If you've ever spoken to an atheist, you know exactly what I'm talking about. In their estimation, everyone around them is an absolute moron. With their own mouths, they give us evidence that the God has set them down. Their foolish heart is darkened, and though professing to be wise, they have become fools. And we see that evidence all around us. It doesn't take more than a minute on the internet to see the attitude of the godless. They think of themselves as brilliant, as geniuses. Look at Richard Dawkins. He is so rude and hostile and disrespectful towards people of faith. And so assured of his own wisdom. He is the very example of what is happening to the man who has rejected God. His heart is darkened. And though professing to be wise, he is a fool. And this goes for Bill Nye and all the rest of them. The, these outspoken atheists, their foolish hearts are darkened. They profess to be wise. They think of themselves as incredibly intellectual. But the reality is they are fools. But it gets worse as this dark creature, parted from God, abides in darkness. Have you ever seen something that is trying to grow in darkness? It, it's mutated and sickly looking and disgusting. It's kind of creepy. Well, that's exactly what happens to a human as they're growing in darkness as well. God gives them over in their hearts to all kinds of wickedness and depravity. Evil, evil desires. The men begin to desire for other men. Women begin to burn with desire for other women. Uh, all kinds of wickedness and disgusting behavior grows in the darkness. And we see that. It's evidence all around us in a society where every single day the news is more disturbing, more shocking, more horrible. I, a drag queen story time is a perfect example of the things that grow in darkness. People who want to dress up in perverse and disgusting and disturbing ways and then pollute and corrupt children in the process. The, the Things that grow in darkness are an abomination. So this is the process of what happens when we reject God, when we fail to give him thanks and honor for his provision. So let's stir up our hearts and make sure that every day we are in God's hand. We're giving him thanks and glory and honor for all he supplies to us. Not only is it nice, it's necessary. This is what God deserves. We, we owe him this thanks and honor. So today I want to give you a little bit of encouragement and advice on entering the end times. We've entered the end times. We're moving through the end times. Christian persecution, if things go on for another 10 years, could become very hostile. It could come to the point of camps, re-education centers, whatever nice title you want to give to them. I have a sip of water. I mean, the Jews in Nazi Germany never dreamed 
that in such a short period of time, they would be locked up, shut away from society, their businesses confiscated and everything else. They never dreamed it would come to that. They were living in a civilized Western world. And at that time, largely a Christian nation, they never dreamed of the persecution that would come. In the same way, many Christians will not dream of the persecution that falls upon them in the Western world. And I want you to be strengthened and prepared. You see, we have a choice of how we want to face the end times. Do you want to be a stupid little sheep with your head down, plucking your tongue and shaking your head and surprised at every turn? Or do you want to take all that God has available to you so that as we enter these end times, you're going in combat ready. You're going in like special forces. You, you have a choice to make. What do you want to do? Do you want to go in like a, a stupid little sheep off to the slaughter with lamb chops? Or do you want to go in a special ops, special forces, combat ready, ready to go in and work with the power and the might that God has made available to us? I'm going to give you some advice on how to prepare yourself. And I'll tell you what, there is one general in this army. There is one leader. And his name is Jesus Christ. He gives us our orders. And he's the one that we turn to to get direction and advice on where we go in this battle. Now, how is the Lord to fight if we all decide that we're just stupid little sheep with our heads down? There won't be a fight. It'll just be a slaughter. And when I say fight, I'm not talking about you buying an, a, a combat rifle and shooting the bad guys. It's, you know, our, our warfare is not with flesh and blood. I'm talking about spiritual combat, being disciplined, trained, and ready to face the enemy. Not the fool, the, the humans who are walking in darkness and governed by demons. I'm talking about fighting principalities and powers in high places. And our, our training begins in James I believe it's in chapter 5. I'm just looking it up because I, I want to be able to read the entire verse to you accurately. It's very important. So I believe it's in verse 16. Yep. Hallelujah. I love it. I got the chapter right. Okay. So the first part is the first part of what we need to do to be combat ready. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Now, wait a minute. What, what, what is that talking about? we got to confess our sins to one another so that we can be healed. I thought we just, you know, ask Jesus to forgive us and all the sins were gone. Well, that's mythology built into the end times church, the apostate church. It's not that simple. You see, there's a sin that does not lead to death, and there is a sin that does lead to death. Uh, heart sin is just those bad moments where we're not at our best. Uh, someone cuts us off, and we might utter something uncharitable. Uh, someone at work gossips about us, and we're angry, and maybe we say something we shouldn't have. Um, we see a person who's homeless. We have some money. We could help that person, but we don't. There are, there are times where we're just not at our best, and those are heart sins. And they're very, very difficult to completely eradicate from our lives. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit in sanctification is conforming us to the image of Christ so that our heart is less and less human and more and more Christ. We are being transformed. But there's a different sin. There's a sin that does lead to death. That's called willing sin. It's something you probably haven't been trained in, but you need to be aware of. Willing sin leads to death. Here's the process. Sin is a process. It's not a deed. The devil sows a seed 
in your mind of lust or envy or jealousy or pride or greed or adultery or whatever. And this is the same as when he met Eve in the garden and had her stop for a moment and consider the tree. Have a look at the fruit. Satan is enticing us at this moment to have a look at the fruit of unrighteousness. We're, we're making the same decisions every day that Eve made in the garden. Eve could have chose to turn away from the serpent, but she didn't. We can choose to turn away from, from these seeds that the enemy plants in us of lust or envy or pride or greed or jealousy or bitterness or strife. We can choose to just reject them, to take every thought captive into submission of Jesus Christ. We can do that. But when we choose not to, when we instead nurture that seed through meditation and contemplation, when we begin to consider that particular sin, we're empowering it, we're giving it life, and it begins to grow inside of us. And it becomes a tree of unrighteousness within us. And over time, that tree begins to bear fruit. This is the natural process of sin. That tree bears fruit. That's its job. That's what it does. It's natural. And you sin, and you're ashamed of yourself, and you're horrified, and you pluck that fruit off, and you repent of your sin. But then tomorrow, another fruit grows. You see, you can, you can pluck the fruit off and throw it away and repent, but the tree is still there, and Satan has authority in your life because of it. So this is the sin we need to be healed of. We need the power of God. Only God can re release you from that bondage. You're, you're a slave to sin because that tree exists in your life. And when we repent, God has the power. This is the righteousness of the gospel. Paul says it in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. This is it. God has the power to remove that tree from your life so it has no power over you. So we confess our sins one to another and then we pray and repent and in faith believe and God can remove that whole tree, just pluck it right out of your life and release you from bondage. I've experienced that power and that freedom and I'll tell you what, there is no feeling in the world like it. Such a victory in Jesus, such a freedom and a liberty after being a slave for more than a decade. There's no, you know, what it does for your faith, it, it increases and strengthens your faith amazingly. We need to practice this. We need to take advantage. So this is the beginning of strength. This is the beginning of being combat ready. Because I'll tell you what, for the next stage, you need to understand what righteousness is. God has called us to righteousness, but not self-righteousness. There's no fruit, no strength, no power in self-righteousness. We need the righteousness of God. That's, that's step one. That's phase one of your training. So it begins, do you have someone that you trust implicitly? that is spirit-filled, that is passionate about living for Jesus Christ. All it takes is one person in your life. And this is something you can do together, pray together, uh, repent of sin, ask for that tree of unrighteousness to be removed, and receive the grace of God to walk in righteousness. And as iron sharpens iron, so one Christian sharpens another as you fellowship, the two of you, where, where two or more are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst, something amazing transpires when two born-again Christians come together. There is a joy and strength that comes out of that. So we need the buddy system in place if we're to be combat ready. Let's honor the buddy system. Jesus sent the disciples out two by two. There is strength in numbers. So find someone, pray it, and ask God, please put someone in my life, Lord, who will be my spiritual partner that I can confess my sins to and walk in righteousness, that we can fellowship and encourage each other and lift up your name. Now, 
I'm going to read the next part of the passage, but you can't go on with the rest of your training until this is in place. I, you know, we're not going to read a bunch of scripture then forget all about it. This has to be put into action as soon as possible. Find someone, begin to confess your sins to them, pray for deliverance from them, walk in righteousness. This is the call of the Christian. Walk in righteousness before God. The next part. The effective, we're talking about prayer here, the effective prayer. Effective means prayers that make a difference, prayers that make change, prayers that have power. So the powerful prayers of a righteous man. The key word is righteous. So if we take step one seriously and God gives us grace so that we walk before him in his righteousness that he has supplied to us, then now our prayers will be powerful. And I'm not sure why the word fervent is missing from this translation, but that is the other um, word that's very important to bring out. The fervent prayers, meaning you're not mumbling, a prayer that is calculated, well thought out, doctrinally accurate, is coming from your mind. You're praying from your mind, and God doesn't want to hear your wisdom or your philosophy. God doesn't need a lecture from you. God wants you to pour out your heart. Paul said that the Spirit intercedes, and what does the Spirit provide? Groans. Oh, I'm sorry for making that a horrible noise, but I want you to understand that the, the word of the heart is not the word of the mind. God doesn't want to hear your philosophies. God doesn't want to hear how doctrinally accurate you are. God wants you to pour out your heart. What's in your heart? The the deepest emotions, the raw truth of your soul, pour it out, and the Holy Spirit intercedes because we don't even know what to pray. You know, your wisdom is futile. It's like swinging in thin air. If you want powerful prayers, you're going to have to listen to the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to pray through you. These are the fervent prayers. You know, Jesus had to go out of town a long ways to pray. And the reason for that, I believe very strongly, is the racket, the noise. He would have kept the town up all night. He cried out to God with all his might, with all his heart. And the Spirit was interceding and praying that which pleased God. When his disciples saw him pray, their jaws dropped. They, they've been praying all their lives, but when they saw the Messiah pray, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. They realized at that point they didn't know how to pray. And I wish most Christians would realize, too, that we don't know how to pray. We're like the disciples. If, if we could just get a glimpse of Jesus praying, we, too, would say, Lord, teach us to pray. But we have something better than that right now. We have the Holy Spirit. If the Spirit of God abides within us, the Spirit will teach us to pray. It's about surrendering your own will and letting go and praying in the Spirit. It doesn't matter what sounds come out. If it's grown, so be it. Grown in the power of the Spirit. Whatever. It's not about English words and, and philosophy and doctrine. It's about letting the Spirit pour through you prayer. Now, the fervent prayers of a righteous man or woman availeth much, or in, in this translation it says, accomplish much. And that's exactly what we need to be combat ready in the end times. If we want to step into the arena of combat and really dominate and overthrow principalities and powers, this is the recipe for success. We have to be trained, we have to be hardened, we have to be ready, we have to be walking in righteousness and praying correctly. I want you to really write these things down, meditate on them, 
and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you so that you too will be battling a strong battle. You will be a dangerous player on the end times battlefield. The Holy Spirit will be able to send you into the worst situations and you will be combat ready. Thank you for joining me today. God bless you.